Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today we are joined by Thomas Drantz, who covers the Canucks for The Athletic and co-host of Canucks Talk for Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver. I've been a real admirer of your work, uh, Thomas, from afar, and I'm really excited for you to join the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thanks for that, Alex. I appreciate the kind intro, and uh, anytime, happy to be here. And I want to first ask a little bit about your career. When did you first think you might want to pursue a career in sports journalism? Yeah, so... You know, I went to the University of Toronto after growing up in Vancouver, and I graduated in 2009 into an economy that had been completely wrecked, uh, decimated. I had some seasonal work that first summer, but when the fall rolled around, despite my degree, uh, you know, I had no options. Like, I, I couldn't find a job washing dishes. Um, so I hustled and I made ends meet, and I finally landed at an IP law firm working as a clerk where... I was bored to tears constantly. It was not the most stimulating job from a um, from the perspective of like a young, curious guy who fancied himself, um, you know, as 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 wanting more and and deserving more in terms of what I got to do day to day, the impact of my work. And so, I ended up tweeting all the time and following hockey all the time. And and of course, this is two thousand nine, two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. The Canucks are ascendant. They're fantastic. I'd always been like a hardcore fan growing up, as I think almost everyone who ends up in my industry is. And, you know, so the Canucks took up a lot of my attention. Now, I lived on the East Coast, which meant that I would stay up till 10 to watch games and then wake up early the next day to go to work. And, you know, I'd sometimes stay up till like 2 a.m. just to listen to like the Curtain Blog podcast the old curtain blog i guess it was on the radio back then on on what was still the team 1040 that's how long ago we're talking about and you know i engaged a lot with various media types on twitter i made fun of the articles and uh you know i was like anyone else uh sort of uh shit posting as it were on i don't know if i can swear but shit posting as it were on uh on twitter and over time you know I i decided like really what I wanted to read in terms of analysis wasn't being offered to me. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it felt like that because I'd spent a lot of time on message boards, um, you know, where a, a variety of other fan bases, most notably the Oilers fan base was sort of beginning to look at advanced metrics, really drill down on like salary cap and CBA minutia. And it felt like every time there was like a Canucks story, you know, it it wasn't quite understood or explained to me the way I wanted it to be explained. Like Mm -hmm. there was a a gap, it felt like to me, between like the data, the predictive metrics, the business side understanding of of why the team was doing so much. And and remember, this was like the Ali and Vino, Mike Gillis era Canucks too, where all of a sudden their player deployment looked like uh, nothing else anyone in the league was doing. All of a sudden... Um, you know, they were breaking all sorts of uh, CBA rules to extend their cap space available to them. And, you know, I, I wasn't having it explained, like, why was, you know, uh, Corey Schneider on the uh, opening day roster? Or sorry, why was Eddie Lack on the opening day yeah. roster instead of Corey Schneider? I d- it didn't feel like it had been explained to me the way that I craved it, the way that I wanted it as like an obsessive fan. And Somewhere along the line, I just figured I'd try to write that. Like, I'd I'd try to take this idea that I had, which was that, like, what I want is this really calm, rational coverage, Hmm. um, which obviously I haven't ended up providing as my career has gone along. But this really sort of, like, measured, don't react too much to results, look at the big picture, you know, the evergreen stuff. How good is this team? Can they win? What do they need to win? Uh, What does this loss mean? Does it mean anything? Is it just that they had, you know, bad luck. Is it just that they were tired? Um, mm-hmm. You know, does, does this loss matter or does it not? And, and I felt as I sort of was watching that, that I wasn't being served and I, I decided I'd step up and try to provide that sort of content, like the sort of content that I myself wanted to read. So I met Cam Davey in Toronto, who was the original operator of Canucks army. And he was kind of recruiting me to write for the site. And I decided I'd give it a shot. Uh, I wrote a piece about Marcus Nasland hmm. um, when his jersey was retired. And then I wrote a piece about Mason Raymond yeah. and, and why he was performing better than uh, the market seemed to be thinking. 
And that was sort of it. From there, I started writing weekly and then I started writing daily and then I started writing multiple times a day. And then I was uh, editor uh, of Canucks Army within like six, seven months. And, you know, within about 10 months, um, Passage Bullis reached out to me because they were affiliated with the Vancouver Sun and offered me a column. Uh, a weekly column. So, uh, so you know, pretty quickly, it felt like I, I began to make some headway and, and get some opportunities that were really exciting from the perspective of, um, you know, beginning to eke my way into the business. And and by the way, while all this was happening too, uh, I lost my job as a clerk mm -hmm. and transitioned to a social media marketing job, which, oh, which wow. was in part enabled by the fact that I'd started this Artem Chabarov Twitter account that now had a few thousand followers. And, and back in, you know, whatever it was, 2010, yeah. uh, the fact that I'd had a few thousand followers with like a sports centric Twitter account was like enough to, to <laughs> get me an entry level sports media marketing job uh, with a company called M30. So um, huh. yeah, no, I mean, it was, uh, it was sort of an organic process, but really you know, I don't think a lot different from what, what some other young up and coming people in this business are going through themselves, even if the time is different and the like established modes of, of Twitter and on and on are, are sort of stronger than they were back when I started. But, you know, I, I like talkie. I enjoyed watching the team and I felt like there was a gap in coverage that I had an idea to address. And, and that was it. The, I sort of took the ball and ran it from there. When, when you started, did you feel as though you had a specific a voice already or and maybe what was your writing process um, at the time? And maybe is it very similar to what it is now? I was really bad. I mean, okay. I was really bad. Like, I, I still go back sometimes and read some of my stuff and think, like, why did I think it was a good idea to write it that way? Like, that's ridiculous. Um, I don't think I had the same voice that I have now, but... I think what I had was an idea, right? Was mm. that there are these new ways of measuring and quantifying and predicting hockey outcomes. And no one has taken those concepts and applied them journalistically as a reporter to covering a team and filtering everything a team does through this idea, this prism, this sort of emerging school of analytical thought. That was what I hadn't done. Like there are a lot of my peers who are research guys, guys who turned out, you know, really innovative ideas. Some of them manage teams now, but I was never that guy. I was never doing original hockey research. I was reading the original hockey research <laughs> and then trying to work that into a story about the Vancouver Canucks. Like that, that was who I was. And so I think I had that idea really early, but I definitely didn't have a polished authorial voice um, or style. Uh, when I started out, I think that came just from doing it day after day, year after year, um, you know, until until I got to a point where I think like my prose is one of my strengths. And and with that, how do you man it, or how do you find a way to mix that looking at an analytics into engaging storytelling? Like for you, how do you blend the two into an interesting article? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I always think about it as. a hook right mm -hmm. and and this is something i tell whenever i i say whenever i go speak to like a journalism students or what have you right like for me every story needs a hook if it's going to do well so often you'll go to an article on the internet and it's a rec uh, recitation of something that they've already read something that they haven't reported themselves something that they've just seen on twitter and content really moved in especially sports content to this sort of space where it's like aggregation compilation it's almost like a, like a girl talk record where it's just like you're mixing a bunch of different news but there wasn't something new something distinct whether, whether it's an editorial opinion whether it's you know and honestly whether it's opinion period or analysis or some new nugget of information like that's your hook something no something your readers can't get anywhere else and and i always saw the way that I filtered the information as being indicative or like an example of a hook, something that I could do that you couldn't find elsewhere. And, you know, this was a day when the Vancouver province had four beat writers covering the Vancouver Canucks and the Vancouver sun had an additional three and both papers had columnists and, and there were the radio stations and like, it was a competitive environment. There were more voices 
and more critical voices covering this team. And, you know, I, I always felt like with my hook, with the analytical hook and the ability to produce takes off of that, uh, I was able to have something different every day. Like I was able to constantly have something now, you know, cooking up takes or coming up with a different angle. That's not, not, not easy. One rule that I've always had though, is don't save ideas. You know, like if you have an idea, it might not work, but try it. You don't have to run it. Um, but don't save your ideas. Like I, I kind of view it that that's like okay. the rule in sitcom writing is huh. it's like, Oh, let's save that for season two. And it's like, no, no, you just, just go use your takes, okay. um, burn through them, challenge yourself to come up with more that keeps it dynamic. That's something that, um, you know, me and Harmon, for example, yeah. disagree on a little bit because he's a little bit more disciplined than me on like, well, this will do really well when this happens. Yeah. And I'm kind of uh, a little more on it. As it were. So, you know, or not on it, but um, yeah. immediate in in sharing. Um, if I have a take, I'm using it as quickly as I can. So, you know, I, I don't know how exactly I come up with the ideas. I think I'm just constantly having a running argument in my head uh, about the Canucks, generally speaking. Like, not, not just shaping my own view, like all fans do, about the team and about the league and about what works in hockey, but also picking at that idea, arguing with myself, sort of putting the onus on myself to prove it. Well, have you considered this? Or could you be wrong? And and I think that's where where it all comes from. But but again, the hook is what matters. Like if you're listening to this and you're an aspiring journalist, you want to get into the business, whether it's hockey or just media in general, I think it's really important to like, if you have a hook and you filter your content through the prism of that hook, it becomes an awful lot easier to stand out Hmm. and to come up with the sort of takes that people want to read. That's really interesting. And I want to ask you, because you've also had a very interesting career that you haven't alluded to, that you worked in PR for the Florida Panthers. And what right. was that experience like for you? And and how did that, how has that experience translated into your writing now since you've moved on and come to the athletic? Yeah. And, you know, my career's taken a lot of um, dips and doodles and, and, you know, there's been a lot of curveballs over the course of the, what, I guess it's 11, 12 years now that I've been in the business, you know, so I, I was working at this marketing agency and r- running Canucks army and the marketing agency got bought and I got laid off mm-hmm. and I was 23, 24. And I had a certain amount of income right? Like I I wasn't making a lot, but I was making like enough to make rent Mm -hmm. from a scattering of freelance holdings that included like Dauber hockey and Canucks (laughs) army and uh, vice sports. I think I was the first person to write sports content for vice uh, up in Canada. Um, The sporting news. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was writing some stuff occasionally for Canucks.com. Um, like I was just kind of grinding it out and, and I wasn't making much, but again, I was making enough to make rent. And so I, when I got laid off, I decided I'm just going to go for it. Like, I'm not even going to go put together my resume or apply for jobs. I'm just going to write. I'm just going to write every day and I'm going to try to stand out and I'm going to try to make this work. And it was uh, the day of the 2013 NHL entry draft is the year they picked Bo Horvat and trade Corey Schneider. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the day after that, I, I returned to Toronto and I, I received a job offer from the score. That's a job I actually had applied for, um, but it was a media job. And I, I got a full-time job on their news desk, uh, did that for two and a half years, ended up at Sportsnet and went back to Canucks Army. And that sort of began something that's been a theme for me throughout my career, which is, you know, holding down two jobs at once <laughs> um, is one way to make this actually work for you financially, yeah. right? That's, I mean, it's not one way to make work-life balance work for you, but it's always been something that I've kept in my back pocket. Uh, in fact, one of the few times that I haven't had two jobs was when uh, Sportsnet sent me to Fort Lauderdale to cover the New York Islanders Florida Panthers series yep. in 2016. Uh, John Tavares with one of the great individual playoff performances I've ever seen. And... I covered that series at a time when the Panthers were uh, undergoing some changes uh, internally. Uh, I made friends with a variety of people. And that summer, they were sort of asking me because their PR had left to go work for the NHL. Like, who are some people around the league that you like? 
Like, who do you like working with? Right. Cause we sort of established that relationship, that friendship. And I was giving them advice. I was telling them people I liked people. I thought they should talk to around the league, people I, whose work I admired. And they kind of came back to me and a- after like four or five months, they offered me the job. They said, huh. would you be interested in interviewing? And I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I've never considered it, but I'm willing to have the conversation for sure. So anyway, we, uh, we end up moving to Florida. We, I go get my immigration pa- papers and I go and I work for Florida. Uh, it was two and a half years working PR. I didn't know what I didn't know when I went down there, but I had a really strong staff, including Adeline Biedenbach, who remains the head of Florida Panthers PR. I'm really glad, uh, happy for her success and for the team's success at the moment. She gets pr- uh, ready to work an Eastern Conference final yeah. for the first time in her career. Um, and But I had a really good staff that helped me through, especially that first year was bumpy. And from there, um, you know, I, I was really proud of the work I did. I think uh, I think we did some really interesting stuff, approached things in a really interesting way and a different way. I think our media services were second to none. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was really happy with that. And I learned a lot in terms of working with a coaching staff, working with a hockey operations group, being ahead of the news, uh, shaping how the team was discussed. And also, and here's where it's really helped me. Yeah. you know, is un- understanding like when you're on the other side, you're all of a sudden anticipating what the media sees. So, mm-hmm. you know, you come in every day for practice and the media is allowed to watch practice. And if a player's not on the ice for practice, like why are they not on the ice for practice? Are they hurt? Right. So you, you have this, like, is this guy skating? Why is he not skating? Is he hurt? How long, what's the timeline? Like, okay, you can say maintenance today, but you better have an update, you know, by game day tomorrow. Right. Right. Um, learning what is visible and how the seams show based on what's actually happening inside mm. to the media outside was was one of the big edges that I got, I think, from that experience and something that I still, um, you know, stick to to this day. Like there's a discipline to being a beat reporter that I think people don't understand, but it, but it includes things like, you know, you show up, you take attendance, right? The first thing you do, who's on the ice? Who's not on the ice? Okay, mm-hmm. why are they not on the ice, right? Let's figure that out. Like there's a process you go through and if you're attentive and watching what's happening, there's also a lot of stories, a lot of information that can be mined from just the small details. And that's something that I I became really attuned to when I worked on the other side and something I still lean on to this day. And, and, and with that, like, why did you, I I mean, you don't have to give me like the, the whole thing, but what made you want to come back and, and go into the media after being in PR and, and, how has that been for you working and, and covering the Canucks um, like as a beat reporter? Yeah. And it's complicated. You know, I knew I'd say about midway through my last season with the Panthers, I knew that I wanted to be back in media. I wanted to be back directly telling stories. Now I was open to other possibilities uh, in terms of remaining, but for the most part, I was pretty dead set on figuring out how to a come back to Canada where my wife could work, right? Because on my current visa, she was unable to work. Hmm. Um, and B, I really wanted to get back to telling stories and ideally telling stories to uh, the marketplace that I'd spent my whole career engaged with. And I'd been talking to a variety of different media folks about what those opportunities could look like when, um, you know, my predecessor at the athletic Jason Botchford sort of tragically passed in May. And from there, our conversations changed, obviously, uh, became a little bit different, uh, not right away, but, you know, we, uh, eventually, um, you know, and, and originally, actually, our conversations were focused on maybe coming back and being an editor. Right. Like I I was maybe going to come back and be an editor and sort of help them, um, you know, hold the fort in in the absence of of Jason, Um, who, of course, I was extremely close with during Mm -hmm. his life. Right. There was a very close relationship, a good relationship there. Um, And, you know, I miss him dearly and and to this day. Um, And, you know, so I started really thinking about how to go about um, making that work in the event. Uh, that that was ultimately what transpired, Um, you know, over the course of that process, I really did some soul searching and realized, in fact, 
you know, I, I like writing. I like to be more of an independent contributor as opposed to the planning guy. I wanted to get back and get my hands, you know, dirty as it were in terms of being the person who tells the story in terms of writing and having my work published. Like that's what I wanted. I wanted to be out front and um, you know, over the course of a, a couple of months in, in June and July of 2019, um, you know, we, we ended up putting together my return. And, uh, so, it, so it went, I, uh, I came back to Vancouver, came back home, which honestly, I never thought I'd do after mm -hmm. university. Like when I didn't move home after university, I just thought I wouldn't come home, but I was, it was a welcome, um, opportunity to come back. My family's still in Vancouver. Um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a blessing to be there and, uh, and I've had a lot of fun, although, I'd have a lot more fun if I had more opportunities to cover meaningful games like I did in the bubble in 2020. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. What's it been like to, to cover a team in, in the Canucks, like your boyhood team, day in and day out now for the Athletic and obviously Sportsnet? And do you feel as though you're as big a fan as you were when you started writing for the Canucks? Is that at all part of uh, your writing or, or your coverage? No, I you know, I dropped the fan voice thing about two, three years into my career, when I, when, if you go read my early work at, at Canucks army, it was very fan voiced. Like there was no question that we were writing as Canucks fans for Canucks fans, which I think was appropriate for the blog medium. And mm -hmm. yet, if you look at my work in terms of chasing interviews, in terms of the, the, the overall tone of coverage, you know, it would be like an intro, like hey there fellow fans and then it would be a pretty standard or not standard but like a pretty professional objective yeah. piece of analysis and then at the end it's like look we can hope that i'm wrong as fans fellow yeah. fans but you know this is what my analysis says and so i dropped that probably when i started working at the score like once i started to have a full-time job in, in sports media, there, there is an expectation. There is a standard. There is a thought in North American uh, sports journalism that you're, that you have to be objective, call it down the middle, not be a fan, not write like a fan, not act like a fan. And I took that to heart. Um, and, and it becomes a discipline, right? Like you, you will find, you, you'll find in any walk of life, you, you have to sort of become in some ways, the person you want to be from mm. a professional standpoint. And so you train yourself to not root. You train yourself to not be a fan. I mean, there are still moments in the press box where someone will make an amazing play where I'll be like, whoa, oh, yeah. Yeah. but it's not, it's not rooting for laundry, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're not cheering for fans or for a team, um, that's completely um, something that has been stripped away from me. And then as you go through your sort of job, right, you work, you work for a team. Right. And like when you work for a team, you are rooting for that team. Like that becomes your, your day to day, like the, um, you know, feeling when that team wins, even if, you know, it's not you winning, you're not on the ice like that is, is something real. Um, and then, you know, once you've gone through that experience, once you know, a lot of people in the business, once you have a sense of how the sausage gets made, <laughs> it, you know, there, like, there's no thought, like, even if I were to leave this line of work now, I couldn't. I've like sacrificed my Canucks fandom. Like there yeah. there's, I couldn't be a fan of the team the same way, mm. even if I were to leave the business, just because I, I kind of, I'll, I'll always root for people like yeah. people more than teams, you know, like I'll, I'll give you an example. Like Chris yeah. Tanev, I covered, right. Yeah. Um, If he wins a cup, I'll be super happy for him. And I, I won't care who wins the, who he wins the cup with. Like mm -hmm. he could win the cup with the Boston Bruins or the Chicago Blackhawks or some team that I absolutely hated 10 years ago. And I'd still be stoked for him. Cause he's a good guy. Like same applies to Troy Stetcher or like any of the people, Sasha Barkov, obviously Luongo, like Luongo could be the GM of, I don't know, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And if he won the cup, that would be awesome. Like I'd be mm -hmm. just ecstatic for Lou. Um, so you root for people. You don't really root for teams. And that's, kind of how it changes as you become um you know in, in involved in the business and yeah it, it would be really hard for me to ever root for laundry again uh in in hockey and honestly across sports like mm. you know I'm sort of a Blue Jays fan and a Raptors fan but even there 
you know, I'm more into the leagues. Like if I like basketball, yeah. I'm more into basketball than I am into the Raptors. I just, it would be fun to see the Raptors win. Yeah. Right. Like it, it, you know, and that, that too has changed where five years ago I was a, a more of a fan of um, a specific team. So yeah, no, I'm not a fan at all. Like I'm just not a fan at all. That's, that's fair to say. Uh, one last thing though, is I am a fan of hockey in Vancouver. Like I think the Vancouver mm. market is super fun and super like whimsical, funny, irreverent, oh. committed, passionate, super knowledgeable. Um, and when this market is really behind a team, when a team is really good in this market and there's the like commingling of like how much it matters here, but also the fear of disappointment, which is overwhelming for Canucks fans. It's such a fun dynamic. It's, it's such a like all consuming dynamic. The Canucks can soak up so much, so much oxygen in the Vancouver market when they're hyper relevant. And, and I love that. Like, I think the Vancouver, I'm a fan of the Vancouver hockey market, like just as a place for professional hockey, high level professional hockey, Vancouver is unmatched, unmatched in my experience anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I want really good things. And I'm a huge fan of the Vancouver hockey market. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, that's a, that's a distinct concept at this point from being a, a fan of Vancouver's NHL team. No, no, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I want to ask you a little bit about the, the the season the Canucks had. Obviously, as an outsider, someone that, you know, watches from afar, isn't uh, covering the team day in and day out. There seemed to be so much turmoil with this team from the coach to Besser, Horvat trade, JT Miller, Tanner Pearson, Hirona trade, Boudreau, everything. For you, how dysfunctional was this Canucks season? And was it maybe the most dysfunctional season you've covered in, in terms of the Canucks? Oh, by far. By far, this season was, I, I can't even think of anything close, honestly. Like, I don't even think there's anything close in Canucks history. I mean, you probably have to go back to like the Jack Gordon era in the mid 80s, but at least that only lasted a year uh, and a half, although it cost the club Cam Neely. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I, I really think you have to go back a ways. Um, you know, even the Torts season was, was nowhere close to this. And the Torts season had, um, you know, the head coach of the team trying to fight the other team's head coach, yep. uh, the Roberto Luongo trade. I mean, uh, the the GM uh, of the team effectively declaring it's my way or the highway and getting fired 48 hours later. I mean, it was, that was a season. And yet when you compare, like, here's what made this one stand out for me. It was the way that the routine stuff added up and overall on the team, mm. right? Like a clash of styles between a coach and a general manager, right? And that coach try like having a, a temper tantrum and trying to fight another coach, right? And benching the star goalie for an outdoor game and that star goalie, you know, his agent getting involved and getting, getting him traded. Um, you know, that stuff's big. That's the big stuff, right? That's like outside in mm -hmm. some ways of a team's control, right? I mean, you can hire a better coach. You can, <laughs> uh, you can control your temper better. Um, but, you know, for the most part, like that's trade market stuff. That's individual actor stuff. Like that's not organizational failure on the same scale, right? That's, that's bigger stuff. That's different. This season began and, you know, they have training camp in Whistler Brock Besser gets injured. The injuries start mounting. The club's skating out at UBC because they're sort of dislocated. They don't they don't have a practice facility. Um, they they uh, didn't always have Rogers Arena. Uh, the ice quality was brutal. Like I think um, you know there was some equipment malfunction at UBC. You could hear players and coaches complaining about the ice quality from the oh sorry. And the reason that they were dislocated was that the locker rooms were still under renovation. Wow. at Rogers Arena because an off-season renovation project hadn't been completed on time. Um, you could hear players grumbling about the ice quality. And as you started to talk to players and heard accounts of what was missing in the gym back at Rogers Arena, where the facilities were at, like, you know, it, it, it was eye-opening in terms of how frustrated the team was with like the basics, like not having the basics. 
And then you get into the season and it opens on the road because the locker room renovations aren't finished. And the team starts 0-7, blowing these leads at a historic clip. And, you know, by the very first game of the year, there's jerseys at home. There's jerseys being tossed on the ice. Um, the team never found their footing. And then the problems just kept coming, right? The the Tanner Pearson injury is a routine one. He's rushed back. He, um, you know, the 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 hand injury becomes significantly worse and infection gets involved. Like that's routine stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. facilities stuff, uh, basic injury management stuff. And then, and then the team kind of finds their footing for just a minute. And the coach gets like publicly undermined in my view anyway, yeah. um, by a management group that clearly didn't want him. And again, like I've seen coaches get blamed. I I've seen leaks where it's like clear that management thinks that the coach is the problem. I know what that sounds like and looks like, but this was different. This was public. This was like um, a, a level of self-sabotage that, that sort of falls outside my experience. And obviously that became its own storyline too. Um, and then you sort of come through to where like players are openly critical, like publicly critical of the, of the, team's handling of the of the Tanner Pearson injury situation it becomes apparent not just that Bruce Boudreaux is getting fired but when he's getting fired and who his replacement will be and yet yep. the team keeps him on for an additional week um the team loses in his final home game and the fans are chanting his name as he as he weeps on the bench yeah. um you know old ladies at church are, are asking about uh about why they're being so mean to kindly old Bruce Boudreaux um and then the team brings in Rick Tockett and goes all out to win games from 27th place in the NHL by point percentage. And then they acquire, they trade draft picks, having acquired them for Bo Horvat for, for a win now piece who only has one year left on his deal. And then, and then, you know, Quinn Hughes plays the most minutes in the NHL after Tockett's hired. Elias Pettersson and JT Miller, both in the top 15 in forwards among ice time. Thatcher Demko, the only guys who played more than Thatcher Demko on after his return to injury were guys like Hellebuck, Markstrom, Saros, and and Georgiev. So three teams who are scrambling to make the final two mm -hmm. spots in the in the West, and the one team that won their division by a point because they were riding their starter. Um, you know, by the time it was over, I was just like, "What what are we doing here? None of this makes a lick of sense." And I, you know, I've never seen a season like that because we're we're not talking about bad trades. We're not talking about uh, individual acts of um, or like individual moments of weakness. We're not even talking about human frailties. It's like it, it feel felt to me as as the evidence piled up over the course of the season that we were looking at like fundamental organizational failure on a scale that I've never seen from this organization. And, and with that, who do you think, I mean, I don't want to make you blame someone directly, but who's the most culpable for the the mess that it seemed to be this year? I mean, you know, I, I think you have to start at the top when the issues are as significant and widespread as these were, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. Yeah. simply, simply put, but I think there's a, a lot of blame to go around. Like the players didn't perform well, right? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think, Bruce Boudreaux had done a great job coaching, right? Like, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that he was part of the solution, uh, although clearly he was part of the solution in terms of turning the club around a year earlier. Uh, one wonders what might have been if he if he'd taken over two weeks prior. Um, but so so say la vie, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I'm not I'm not sparing anyone from from criticism to be clear. But I I think when it's you know, this multifaceted, I think you gotta, you gotta point your eyes upward. And and with that, obviously it seems as though management is, in, uh, is going to go for a retool or try to make this team make the playoffs. I know you said that, what are the chances they can pull a, off a, a retool that's successfully in terms of them making the playoffs and maybe even going deep in the playoffs? Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be really challenging, but not impossible when you, when you have Demko, right? Hughes and Pedersen, you have a pretty good base to, to build a 95 point team or so 
The one thing I'd say though, is I don't think anymore. Like, I don't think the league is in, in a place where you can like luck into the playoffs as people used to say you could. Um, not to say that there aren't going to be some one and done teams or that teams don't have outlier seasons as a result of finishing luck or goaltending luck. Um, you know, I, I mean, you could see a team like a Seattle, for example, prove to be a flash in the pan. And yet I watch them play and I think that team speed is real. Um, you know, the, the way they play in terms of breaking the puck out, that's real. That's systematic. And their depth is real. Like that's a real thing you have to contend with. I just think there's too many smart teams in the league. Like, you know, set, 10 years ago, I'd see moves and there were like eight teams moves that made sense. I'd be like, there's like eight smart teams in this league. <laughs> and now I think it's like there's 25. Now I think the teams that aren't smart stand out. The teams mm-hmm. that don't have a plan stand out. And that's not to say that, you know, if there's 25 smart teams, there's nine that aren't making the playoffs. But that's how hard it is to make the playoffs. I, I look out West and I see a Kings team that you know, still probably need some offensive pop, but they're smart. They have a plan. It, every time they bring in a player, you know, it fits their like speed profile, right? Like it, 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 it all makes sense to me in terms of, um, you know, how Rob Blake wants to go about winning. Uh, you look at the Seattle Kraken, their analytics department, the way that they've used their cap space, saved their cap space, um, you know, sort of gone about building out their minor league team. I mean, you know, I, I haven't always been, um, I haven't always praised Ron Francis, but I think you can say that the crack can have a plan that they're a smart team. Um, Calgary, who knows? Like that's the big, that's the big sort of wild card here, but uh, Vegas is clearly a smart team. And then Edmonton has the two best players on the planet. And then this ducks team, I still think is one where yeah. you, know, you need to, you need to keep your eyes trained on the rear view mirror. Maybe it's not next year. Maybe it's not even the year after, but there's going to come a time where that ducks team is ascendant. And I sort of look up and down the Pacific and just think, you know, I don't, I, if you're, if you're hoping to luck into the playoffs, uh, that's not going to do it because there are at least three smart teams plus uh, a team with two of the best players on the planet on it and a Calgary flames team that without a lot, like doesn't need a lot of salt and pepper, doesn't need a lot of seasoning to have a pretty significant bounce back themselves. So, I I mean, I do think it's going to be a tall order, but, the Canucks do have ta- have a lot of talent. Like there's a lot of high end talent on this team, uh, and I do think that the team has gone uh, or has done a lot to address what I always saw, or at least what I saw the last two years, as like a fundamental flaw, like a flaw so fundamental they weren't going to be able to overcome it, which was their ability to move the puck out from the back end. By the time you replace, you know, your Hamonic Shen, um, you know, sort of class. What Hamonic Shen, uh, OEL, we saw him go down toward the end of the year. Like, by the time you replace some of those slower, less skilled defenders with you know, and, and they don't even have to be world beaters, like, we only saw Heronic for four games, but with Bear and with you know, even a Hiroshi type or or Willannon, it's like all of a sudden that defense is a lot more mobile and can move the puck better. And the Canucks clearly have like the ability to be a top 10 power play group, maybe, maybe better. Um, and the ability to score, right? Like this team can fill the net. If you can do that and you can move the puck well enough, I, I think you might be on to, on to something, but whether that's something is 98 points in a playoff berth or whether it's, you know, n- 93 points in the 13th overall pick. Uh, I don't know. Like uh, either way, either way, I, I think they're, making the path that they'll have to walk to accomplish what we all want to see, which is, you know, fun hockey in Vancouver. I think they're making that path unnecessarily narrow, uh, which isn't to say they won't be able to tightrope walk across the river. It's just like, I'd rather see them build a highway, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like that's, I like, like people often ask, like, can they cross the rickety suspension bridge? It's like, maybe, I, I mean, my point's not, whether or not they can can do it or not it's shouldn't they have built something better yeah. shouldn't they have built something sturdier like that's really where i'm sort of approaching this from no, no for sure it feels as though there's not a big margin of error like they kind of have to hit everything right and with that i i want to ask you you've you've had two pieces out on the canucks um recently about their off season and you've talked about the five options they have basically different directions they can do to address their cap. And and you listed just today about 
um, like tiers of uh, contracts on the Canucks for you to make this team maybe rock walk along that crickety bridge what did the Canucks need to do and 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 in what fashion to to make their cap sheet look much more efficient yeah I mean you know the it's going to be really tough because everyone knows that they're capped out right so they're starting from the back foot um you know the Ekman Larson question is an intractable one. And really like, I really like working with him. And I think when his foot speed is there, he's like a really classy two way defenseman, but I don't know how to analyze whether or not he's just on the back nine or whether or not he was just injured early in the year. But I know that when a 31 year old begins to slow down, whether it's because of injury or not, it it becomes a, you know, a sucker's bet to just be like, they'll bounce back from injury. You know, like I remember Chris Higgins being a 45 point guy and then breaking his foot in the very first preseason game. And he was never really a full-time NHLer again. And it wasn't like Chris Higgins is the hardest working player you'll ever see. Right. Like, in wild core strength, professional to the hilt, quality human being, but you can't catch up. Like once you're older, you can't catch up. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to work so hard and, and yet you've already lost ground to all these younger, more athletic players coming up into the league. Like it's hard to catch up from an injury at that age. So it's not like we're talking about a 22 year old or like Jonathan LeCaramacki, the, the Canucks top prospect where it's like, you know, he had an injury plagued season at an, as an 18 year old. Well, that's important context. I'm not betting against him bouncing back from those injuries, but when, once you're 30, 31, 32, when you played, you know, eight, 900 NHL games and you played defense, right. And you've had lower body surgeries and you play a physical game and you need to play a physical game. Like, you know, I, I re- I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for him. Like, you know, I say I root for people like I'm rooting for Oliver Ekman Larson. Yeah. Cause I can tell he still loves the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a big ask. Like it just is. It's just a big ask at his age to find a step, even if his off season last year was waylaid by injury. Hopefully, hopefully he can figure it out. It would be amazing. Um, but you know, that contract becomes a really big problem, a, a real millstone. I mean, he has, if he's not at the level of a third or fourth pair, like th- three, four, like a second pair defenseman, and he's making, you know, I mean, he's got the 14th highest yeah. cap hit in the league, the 25th in the league once the Arizona Coyotes retain 1.01 million. Um, you know, that's that's something that becomes really hard to work around. I mean, look at Dallas. OK, Dallas is a really good example. They're playing in the conference final They're They open their series, series on Friday. Sagan and Ben have bounced back for them this season. Like they played their best hockey in the last three years this season. And that made a huge difference because those guys take up 19 million combined, which is a problem. And when you're paying 19 million combined to two bottom six guys, you're dead in the water. Once Sagan starts to play like a second line guy and Ben like a middle six guy, well, now now you can at least overcome it. I mean, you still need Robertson, Ottinger, has Haskin yeah, in yeah. Wyatt Johnson. Like you still need a lot to go your way, but at least you're not sunk, right? Like the difference mm-hmm. between Ekman Larson being at least like a three or four quality guy and being what he was this season, which was like replacement level, right. Was like, you'd have been disappointed with him at 800 K. Yeah. I mean that, that sinks, you can't come back from that. And you know, it's not just on him, right? Like they also got a replacement level contribution from Tyler Myers, right. They also got replacement level contribution from um, Brock Besser. Right. And, and I mean, right there, we're talking about 20 million. Uh, and then JT Miller wasn't, was actually good value for his contract last season, but his contract last season was 5.5. Yeah. He wasn't good value at the 8 million that he'll begin to make next year. So he needs to bounce back to justify his new contract, which hasn't even kicked in yet. Uh, he's signed through the balance of this decade and he turned 30 in March. I mean, you know, you, you sort of put that together and it's just like the dark clouds on the horizon are, are really significant for me and, and kind of overwhelm my analysis. Like how do they solve it? I, I think they kind of need to, be willing to be super disciplined for a year or two. Like I think they need to be willing to stop pushing their chips into the middle of the table, maybe take their lumps, um, you know, certainly try to figure out uh, how to clear things up over the long term. 
And, you know, that's not an answer the organization wants to hear because of the, you know, Pedersen Hughes are in their prime seasons factor. It's not, it's not an answer to this market, um, you know, which has only seen, well, which hasn't seen playoff hockey played in Vancouver since 2015 wants to hear. Um, But, you know, I I don't know, like, I don't know that charging at this brick wall, um, you know, year after year, the way that they're doing is, is going to result in, in anything worthwhile. And I mean, that just, you know, that colors my analysis and, and it's sad. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like it's not, I don't relish this. It's just my honestly held read on where the Canucks are relative to the rest of the league and, and sort of what knots they've tied themselves into. And and with that, I know to, to try to go to a bit of a bright spot for the Canucks, they finally have a first round <laughs> pick. Well, let's see if it's still with the Canucks. Uh, in, in Oh, I, in, I thought you were going to go positive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I know you've written about um, what they might do at 11. What would maybe be your ideal selection at 11 out of the players rumored to be available then? And um, yeah, just what what's your take on that 11th overall pick? Well, my, my view is you hope someone elite falls, right? And there's a few guys who I think are super elite in this draft who could fall. Uh, Zach Benson is like, the number one guy like I think Zach Benson's a home run for whoever picks him like if you pick him five through you know certainly 11 but if you pick him as high as five honestly if you pick him as high as four I think that's like a great pick um so he I'm sort of all in on Zach Benson and I think he's the guy you hope falls but would this team have the gumption to take the undersized scoring winger given the construction of their roster right that's the big question for me you know, I, I'm hearing a lot, like, I think that they're, you know, they'd ideally like a defenseman. Like, I, I do believe that as much as they'll talk about best player available and on and on, like, I do think at the end of the day, that best player uh, is o- almost sure to end up being a defenseman. Wow. wow. Um. So, I mean, I, I think this team recognizes their significant needs on the blue line and will throw some draft capital at, at addressing that issue. Um. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's the good thing about the 11th pick is like someone's going to fall, right? Like um it's not going to be Reinbacher, I don't think. It's not going to be the big right-handed defenseman, but someone is going to fall. Um, you know, whether it's a uh, Matthew Wood or a or um a Benson or a Ryan Leonard or um, you know, a player like that, like someone really really good is going to be available to the Canucks and this could be one of the best draft classes since 2015, particularly for forwards. Um I just like to see the team sort of proceed with like real BPA in mind uh, and be willing to capitalize off any weirdness, funkiness on the draft board as it unfolds ahead of them. But that might be difficult. Like one thing they did last year is they took the guy who fell. Yeah. Like Jonathan LeCaramacchi was widely considered to be a top 10 quality pick, a guy who was unlikely to be in range for the Canucks. He fell and then he has a, a pretty miserable D plus one season. By the way, that was still a good pick. Um, I like the home run cuts. I'd like to see the Canucks take a home run cut one way or the other. Um, so, you know, I, I like a guy like even Dmitry Simashev, the, the big Russian defenseman who's sort of more a puck mover than a physical guy, despite being six, four, 200 pounds like that to me, like those are the sorts of packages that are super unique. Um, you know, that kid was named, uh, Charles Harley and came from, you know, Saskatchewan, Lake Waskasu. He, he, you know, that, that guy's going top five. Um, so, you know, those are the sorts of things that I, uh, that I would be looking for the Canucks to do. I'm not dead set on them against them taking a defenseman again. I think there are a couple guys who, who could justify a selection that high, um, including the Russian gentleman that I, that I just mentioned, but Mm -hmm. for the most part, I think, uh, I think you take what falls, you take what, um, what sort of filters through the cracks in the top 10. Uh, and I'd love to see the Canucks do that. And I just want to quickly follow up because Matt is a Matt Vay Mitchkov. I want to get that right, but mm, yeah. he, he might fall. And I know you think that um, I know you said that you think the capitals would pick him up, but if he were there at 11, would, would the Canucks make a move like that where you might not have a guy for two, three years? I mean, I I'll, I'll applaud them if they do, but what about this organization's posture suggests yeah. to you that they're willing to wait three years for this guy? Nothing nothing you but, know i mean yeah. it would be it would be an absolute home run cut and even whether it works or not you know i'll applaud it first of all I, I suspect they won't have the chance okay but second of all even if they do um 
yeah, second of all, even if they do, uh, you know, uh, we'll, I'll believe it when I see it. And uh, I, I just want to, before, I have a fun little question at the end, but for you, like, I know you mentioned you think they can get to to maybe 93, maybe 98 points, maybe less, maybe more, but what would, for you, be a successful season for the Canucks next year? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think the team, like, you know, my, my definition of what would be a successful season in theirs is probably massively different, but I think given their positioning, the playoffs are like the absolute, like you, you have to make the playoffs and you have to show you belong when you get there. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll actually give them, um, you know, a lower standard than I think is reasonable, but like you, you need to make the playoffs and you need to not get pounded not look completely out of place, not be exposed as a lucky team when you get there. If the Canucks can do that, you know, I think we come away from it and say, hey, decent. The problem is, is even if they do that, Patterson, Hern, and Ronick are on the last year of their deals. They're going to get more expensive. The team's going to need to still be improving, um, you know, to, to pay that off, right? Like for me, that's a successful season. If it's the start of like a multi-year run of making the playoffs with a group that all levels up together, right, and begins to accomplish meaningful stuff as a, as a as a core group, a core group that the Canucks have now committed to and and frequently name check of like Kuzmenko, Miller, Patterson, Hughes, Demko. Um, so it's, so it's multifaceted. It's like a successful season next year requires them to make the playoffs and look like they belong in the playoffs, but. It also requires it to be a launching pad to like sustain success based on the path that they've carved out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that they can have a successful season as a standalone. It needs to be the start I see. of something that actually matters um, and that actually proves that this, you know, Rutherford Alvin um, direction, uh, the, the short term direction actually can deliver like sustained success in Vancouver. And and with that, obviously, uh, Vancouver Hockey has a really cool up and coming player who just got well will be drafted by the Chicago Blackhawks in, in Connor Bedard. I know you yeah. gush about him. For you, uh, Thomas, what do you think makes Connor Bedard so special? He's he he's just got it. He's just got it. Like for me, it's not the shot, although that's amazing. Um, you know, it's not the speed. It's not the workout habits although it kind of is like it's it's you know he's not big he's not the fastest guy uh he is an elite playmaker and he's an elite shooter but the the hockey skills to me are secondary it's it's the way this guy works you know what it is man it's like Mm -hmm. i've had a chance to chat with andrew crystal and matthew wood and um zach benson and you know all the guys who came up with like kent johnson even right um um macklin celebrini who was also at the North Shore Winter Club and and will probably be the first overall pick in 2024. And like but Dard's exalted by this group, right? Like it's not a normal these guys don't talk about Bedard like he's a normal human being. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like they talk about him like a guy who because they spent time around him and competing against him and working and watching him work on the ice, they all got better too. You know, mm-hmm. he, he's the sort like his coach. So when he was playing um, like U16 hockey, right. He was playing up an age group to play U16 hockey. And he's going through the, the testing um, to get a uh, special status in the WHL, something the WHL had never previously granted. And, you know, his coach, his coaches would go to him and be like, Hey, who do you want to play with on the power play? Like, how do we put you in a position to succeed? He's like, just put us in a position to win, man. You know, like he, he, he's just got it. He's just got it. He's got that special quality. And and again, not in terms of his play, although there too, but in terms of how he works, how he competes, how focused he is, who he is. That's why I'm so high on Connor Bedard. You can just tell when you talk to people about someone who resonates differently, you know, and, and this kid resonates differently with everyone who's ever had the opportunity to work with him. Um, that's going to enable, like, he might not come in to the league next year and be, uh, have a McDavid like first year impact. In fact, I think there are some things he's going to have to materially learn about the NHL game. Okay. But when you're someone with his capacity for learning his competitiveness, 
his approach to being the best, you're always going to get there. Like you're always going to get there. He, yeah. He's that guy. That's why I'm so high on him. What, what's his ceiling in your mind? Like, is it, can he be better than a McDavid, a Crosby? Is that, is that uh, possible for him? I don't think that's fair, but I think, okay. I think this is, I expect Connor Bedard to at some point be among the best players in the world. Okay. You know, like that to me is I expect him to be at some point among the be- very best players in hockey on the planet earth. And I, I mean, that's high enough. I don't think it's fair to like compare him to other guys um, just because, you know, no, uh, the, w- w- the the standard that Crosby and McDavid have said is so ludicrous. Um, you know, those guys, those guys are flirting with like best of all time status. Um, you know, I, I, more than anything, I just think Bedard's going to be the type of player who, um, you know, uh, can, can be among the very best players in the world. That, that is my genuine expectation for him at this point, And I, I think it's a fair one. Mm-hmm. And um, before I let you go, I'll just ask you, do you have a Stanley cup pick? I know like the final four starts today. So I think it's Vegas. Okay. I'm picking, uh, so let me do this. I'm picking Vegas and Carolina for the cup okay. final. And okay. I think both series are going to be long six or seven. Um, so yeah, I'm picking Carolina and picking Vegas. And you know, if I, if I had to pick between them, I'd, I'd narrowly prefer Vegas. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for taking the time and coming on. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to give you the floor. Is there anything at the athletic or at Sportsnet that you want to plug that people should uh, keep their eyes and ears open for. No, thanks, man. Uh, you know, follow me at Thomas Drance on Twitter. My DMs are open. That's how we set up this podcast. Feel free to engage me on whatever platform you'd like. Uh, I, I, I like I live to talk Canucks hockey with fans. So if you're interested, if you have any follow up questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I want to invite your listeners to do that. Uh, aside from that, you know, the athletic and, and go subscribe to the Canucks talk podcast wherever you will get your podcasts, whether it's Spotify or Apple, whatever. I, I mean, you know, wherever you find your podcast, whatever podcatcher you use, <laughs> Knox Talk at Sportsnet 650, it's available there. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me, man. A- always a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I think you uh, plugged my podcast by saying it's available everywhere. So people should know that too. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, hopefully next year uh, you can uh, be uh, covering the Canucks in the playoffs, uh, in the playoffs. And hopefully yeah, let's uh, go. They, uh, they have a, they, it's the start of a, some success for them. So thanks so much, Thomas. I really appreciate it. All right. Cheers, man. Bye.